50 years ago, no one had come close to walking on the moon. Marilyn Monroe had only been married once. And this is how we used to dance. And we certainly knew nothing about global warming. Well, things have changed, but one thing has stayed the same. Believe it or not, the small number of large power stations we opened 50 years ago in remote parts of the country are still the ones we rely on today. These fossil fueled dinosaurs waste two thirds of the energy we put into them. The lack of efficiency in this old centralized system is unforgivable, as is the fact that 30% of the United Kingdom's CO2 emissions come from these big power stations. In the 1970s, the oil crisis sent the government searching for North Sea oil and gas and perpetuated our inefficient use of fossil fuels. Our power stations use fossil fuels to supply electricity, and electricity only. The heat generated is literally blown away in the cooling towers, or disappears into our rivers and seas, or along the transmission wires. By the time it reaches our homes, two-thirds of the energy has been thrown away. Well, that's enough to supply all the heating and hot water needs of the UK. With this wasted energy comes pointless CO2 emissions. What are we thinking of? Right now, we don't need more energy, we just need to use it better. It would be perfectly possible to cut out the waste. In a decentralized model, you could have smaller, cleaner, more efficient energy sources near to where they're needed. This would mean both the heat and the electricity could be used. This type of decentralized energy is called combined heat and power, or CHP. Faced with the same energy crisis in the 1970s, many of our European neighbours chose a different path, one which could so easily help solve the problems we have here today. In the Netherlands, they thought, OK, when we make electricity, we're also making heat. So let's use that. Kees den Blanken, head of CoGen Netherlands, explains. The combined generation of heat and electricity is great stuff because there you find true efficiencies because electricity generation automatically co-generates a lot of heat and if you use that in a good and useful application to heat homes or industrial processes you double the efficiency that you have in using the fuel. You probably wouldn't know it to look at but they've broken down the old wasteful centralized model of energy here and people are getting their heat and power from right amongst these buildings where they live and work. The CHP unit out here on the square is providing the heat and cooling for all the office buildings and 400 of the houses in this neighborhood as well as that it generates electricity which is put onto the grid and actually is being used physically in this neighborhood as well. The generators are smaller, cleaner, more efficient and more reliable. Now, as we begin to worry about the climate and security of our own gas supply in the future, surely it's time to make sure we use what we have as efficiently as possible. The less we use, the less we need, the less fossil fuel dependent we become. If you look at the Netherlands, half of our electricity comes from CHP plants. And actually, having very many smaller points of supply brings a much more stable and reliable total system into effect than having only a couple of big central power plants. So if you combine the generation of your heat and electricity, you more than double your efficiency. Not exactly rocket science, is it? Moving away from old centralized systems into more local models, you can heat and power homes and businesses better. But does it work on a larger scale? The Rocker 3 plant heats and powers the equivalent of 100,000 homes across Rotterdam. As engineer Anna van der Maal tells us, what makes this place special is that it heats 4,000 hectares of greenhouses. Agriculture on a massive scale and makes use of the CO2 as fertilizer before it's released into the atmosphere. These customers, these greenhouses, 
they use a lot of heat. The volume of heat is about two thirds of the, the demand of Rotterdam. But they only want the heat if they also get supplied carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide, normally it goes to the environment. So instead of pumping it to an oil well or a gas well, we use it as a fertilizer in greenhouses. It's greenhouse gas, but not as we know it. A recent EU study found that right now, combining heat and power, or CHP, is the single biggest solution for reducing CO2 emissions from energy generation. So is combining heat and power the complete answer? Well, almost. In reality, it uses fossil fuels. So in that sense, it's not the ultimate remedy to all the problems. It is only using the fossil fuels we have left with a double efficiency, thereby halving emissions and doubling the resources we still have left. We buy time that way to find the ultimate solutions. And there are people here in Copenhagen looking at that longer term solution. You double your efficiency by combining heat and power wherever you can. At the same time, you start moving away from fossil fuels and into cleaner alternatives. In Denmark, multi-fuel power stations aren't just a vision of the future. They're here today. Like this one, Avador, which supplies electricity to the grid and heat to Northern Europe's largest district heating network. We have two units at Avador. Avador 1 is a coal-based power plant. Avador 2, uh, we are not allowed to use uh, coal over there because coal is a fuel that contains the most CO2. Uh, gas contains about 60% CO2 compared to uh, coal. And then we use biomass, which is CO2 neutral fuel. About 50% of the fuels uh, is biomass. So biomass includes fuels like straw and wood, which can be CO2 neutral. With its 95% efficiency, this place is a world record holder. Here, three of these enormous bales of straw can supply enough heat for a home for an entire year. Or put another way, one kilo of straw can run a light bulb for 24 hours. Impressive. It's ridiculous that the best we can do in Britain is about 35% efficiency in our coal-fired power stations. Whereas a multi-fuel power station like Avador is 95% efficient. It runs on five different fuels and should be today's standard. It works like this. They doubled the efficiency in their coal burner by using both the heat and power generated. They then added a second burner, which runs on a mixture of gas and the straw and wood from the surrounding area. The straw would otherwise be burnt in the fields by farmers, and the wood scrapped. This biomass is pulped, burned at incredibly high temperatures, generating useful energy as both electricity and heat. With additional electricity coming from wind turbines. The key to these superb efficiencies is having two networks one for electricity and one for heat. In the case of Copenhagen, the heat network covers 85% of the city. Not bad. And while they're making better use of their fossil fuels and using cleaner options like biomass, they're also investing in completely renewable technology such as this wind farm in the city's harbor. In Denmark, wind power is so big it meets about a fifth of their electricity needs. People here in Denmark live and work amongst one of the most efficient energy systems in the world, whether they're aware of it or not. They see the traffic lights, they turn on the computers, mobile phones, heat their homes. Everything essential to the functioning of modern society they're able to take for granted. 
Whereas here in the United Kingdom, we take our energy for granted too. But most of us are oblivious to the fact that we are living with an outdated energy system which is so inefficient we lose two-thirds of the energy before we even turn on a switch. So why are we paying for energy which, in the most part, is disappearing into the air? I mean, in Denmark, when you buy a beer, you get a full beer. But here in the UK, it's like we pay for a full beer and you only get about a third of it. There should be a law against it. We wouldn't allow it to happen to our beer, so why our energy? But all is not lost. We do have a couple of pockets of excitement, such as Woking. About 10 years ago, the pioneers of Woking Council decided they would save some money and get a bit more efficient by creating their own combined heat and power network. Today, through a CHP unit in the town centre car park, they generate enough heat and power for all the civic buildings in the entire town centre, and even the Holiday Inn next door. Woking's leisure centre, retirement village and other civic buildings are all heated and powered by the council through their very own highly efficient CHP units, photovoltaic cells and solar thermal panels, and even a hydrogen fuel cell. These aren't new technologies, they're just common sense. In fact, this little council has managed to cut its CO2 emissions by 77%. Now, if only every council would do that, then imagine going one step further. Welcome to Malmö in Sweden, where the local ice hockey team haven't lost a home game for 37 years. But that's not the best thing about this place. People now come to see a vision of the future. An engineer involved in this project from the very beginning talks about the original vision. We wanted to show that it's possible. You can build this. We take one step further. This is possible to have a, a system that is 100% renewable. Imagine a community which is heated and powered by 100% renewable energy. It could look a little like this. You've got your homes, offices, community buildings, all hooked up to a district heating network. The hot water and heating could come from geothermal or through solar thermal panels or from combined heat and power plants run on biomass. So you turn on the tap and you've got hot water and your buildings are warm. For electricity, you've got the same CHP and you could have a wind farm nearby and photovoltaic cells. With individual buildings, there could be micro wind turbines built into the roofs of the buildings themselves. Sounds like an energy utopia. But in fact, it's already happening right here in Malmo. And what is new here is that normally you have a collector on a building and you use it only in the house. But here we, we uh, have connected it to the district heating network. So even though if you don't need it in the house, we can put it out in the network and you can use it anywhere. Integrating renewable energy into the fabric of the buildings has become central to the design approach. A good example is the leisure centre, which is so effective that its solar thermal panels are benefiting the surrounding community, as well as meeting its own needs. While our neighbours are growing ever smarter about being more efficient and using cleaner fuels, we're thinking we need more power from fossil fuels or even nuclear. The point is, we don't. We just need to be more efficient with fossil fuels, use more, cleaner fuels such as biomass, and develop renewables as fast as we can. There's no excuse when it's being proven elsewhere. But why is it that some countries have managed to get it so right while well, we seem to have it so wrong. In Sweden, the tax on carbon dioxide, I think, is the highest in the world. The government has to facilitate these markets. We have a tax reduction when we're producing heat on biomass. We don't pay heat taxes, which we do on the coal and the oil. And very favorable electricity prices for the electricity from CHP plants. And we are also 
a guaranteed a fixed price on the electricity that we produce on straw and wood pellets. Investment, subsidies and grants, reduced natural gas prices when you would burn the natural gas in a CHP plant. They who have the best plans to use that waste heat, they have the best chance to get the permit to build a power plant. Maybe it is also needed just to forbid a couple of inefficient technologies. Back here in Blighty, we're seeing some encouraging signs, but the same old centralized way of thinking keeps getting in the way. In London, a new energy services company is looking at co-generation, tri-generation, renewable energy, fuel cells, the works. We need to get behind that. One man, Alan Jones, who saw it all happen in Woking, is now at the London Climate Change Agency with big plans for London. But there are difficulties. We've got some regulatory barriers uh, in place that are actually preventing micro-generation, preventing co-generation, tri-generation, renewable energy at a scale that could compete with the grid, and maybe that's the issue here. Uh, Decentralised energy is far more efficient than centralised energy. If those barriers were removed, we could trade not only between the larger sites, but also with the individual domestic sites as well. We're not talking primary legislation here. Uh, the Secretary of State could achieve this at the stroke of a pen. It's as simple as that. So why hasn't it been done? Well, why hasn't it been done? Why do we stick with an outdated energy system reliant on coal and gas, which is in need of renewal anyway? Doing nothing is not an option. The UK is about to replace nearly half of its energy system, no matter what, as the old power stations shut down. Why do we think we need more power when we throw away two-thirds of the energy we generate now? Why would we invest billions in a new nuclear programme that we simply don't need? Tony Blair says we need to make some hard decisions. Well, the decision isn't hard, it's really easy. It's common sense. Decentralised energy offers us a cleaner, cheaper, more secure way ahead. Let's look forward instead of back and create a new energy system that is smarter and better for all of us.